Okay, so let's start the last plenary lecture for today. So please uh, have a seat. So our next speaker is Neil Ashton. He's the principal computational engineering specialist at Amazon Web Services. Uh, he has an impressive uh, CV with previous positions at Oxford University, NASA Ames, Formula One Lotus team, and um, his expertise is developing the next generation CFD approaches, including machine learning, high fidelity turbulence modeling, and um, uh, high performance computing, of course. So without further ado, please. Great. Okay. Thanks very much. And, and yeah, thanks for the uh, invitation. It's an absolutely beautiful venue here. Uh, it really is staggering. So, and thanks to the organizers for a, for a great event. So it was really good that we had the previous two talks. Um, I think they set the scene for some of the industrial challenges, um, whether it's on ship design or whether it's more for um, wind engineering or bridges. Uh, and hopefully a few of the things that I'm talking about today will um, will address some of the challenges that they uh, that they talk, that they spoke about. And um, maybe the first one is most people, first of all, have no idea who AWS are um, and probably think, why would somebody from AWS or Amazon be speaking about CFD? Um, but actually, we do a lot of CFD at, at, at Amazon. So first one, data center design. I think we probably have the, you know, the most data centers probably for almost any company in the world. Um, hundreds or thousands of data centers that all need designing, the cooling, the water management, environmental. Uh, fulfillment centers, global fulfillment centers um, all around the world. Again, those buildings need certification from cooling, fire risk, uh, environmental. Uh, we also operate one of the largest truck fleets uh, in the world, both large trucks, small trucks. Um, we, if we can save one or 2% on drag uh, and fuel savings, that can save hundreds of millions of dollars because of the size of the fleet. Um, Prime Air is the drone delivery program that's um, being developed. And then of course, there's things like Alexa ring devices and they all need some sort of uh, thermal uh, and cooling design. And then finally, there's the AWS bit, which is you know a subsidiary of Amazon, uh, which is the bit that I work for. And then that's um, more the hardware and the middleware, I guess, for people who want to run their, their CFD. Um, what's interesting as just a, I guess, a very brief history is AWS started just as the compute for Amazon. Like most companies have a compute platform. People have an in-house cluster or, or something. That's how AWS started 2006. It was actually not for high-performance computing, it was for databases and for web services to run amazon.com. Uh, but in the end, it grew and grew and, and spun out into its own company. So um, OpenFoam is actually used quite widely within the company for some of those things that I mentioned just there. So um, even though I'm uh, from AWS, I, I chair the Amazon CFD working group where all the departments come together who are doing CFD to share best practices and findings. And as I said, yes, we, we use OpenFoam from many different providers. Uh, some of them are in the room here. So that's just to say that there is, a, there is an interest um, beyond just AWS of why we want to advance the state of uh, CFD. Um, uh, linking to what was spoken about before though, um, it, it's, it's impressive to me just how much CFD is, being, is growing and growing and growing from the smallest companies all the way up to the largest enterprises. Uh, and obviously that's, uh, I don't need to tell people in the room this, that's because there's a ever more challenging um, competitive space for products, whether it's aircraft, whether it's fridges, whether it's phones, whether it's fans. And so everyone's looking to do something in the fastest possible time with the most accuracy. Uh, and of course, one of the core things uh, that I think the first speaker spoke about was almost the digital certification or the idea that sometimes you can't make a physical product, that you have to use CFD very early on. And so it's not good enough just for it to make some nice colorful pictures. 
it actually has to be accurate enough to make design decisions without maybe some physical testing. So um, whilst you know CFD has come a long way, the the point of this talk is really how can it go even further and how can the cloud, HPC, and um, machine learning uh, play a part in that? Uh, but I always start these talks by saying the same thing, even though most of us in the room are probably pro CFD. Um, if you go to almost any company and you go higher up the management chain, CFD is just a tool. And if it's not more accurate or cheaper than a physical test, there is no emotional attachment to doing the CFD. They will just go and do a wind tunnel test or a physical test. So um, I, I guess some of the focus today is quite a lot on the cost side. I started my life and I still consider myself an academic where very rarely do we consider cost. Very few papers put the cost of their method in. It's about the accuracy. Conversely, when you're in industry, you realize very quickly how cost or the simulation is equal or perhaps even more uh, important. Um, and I, I kind of disagree a little bit with what Joel said about we've solved turbulence modeling and now we're going on to the multi-physics stuff. Uh, I actually think the turbulence modeling bit, by the way, my PhD was in turbulence modeling, so I'm biased, is still one of the biggest challenges because it's the underpinning of anything you put on top of it. So I'll kind of focus on that. And I think anything that I talk about today is only more complicated when you add all the extra physics on top. So hopefully it still makes sense, even though I won't have many slides on combustion or, or you know, multi-physics. Um, the point of cost, uh, and I have shown this slide before, but I, I'll show it again because I think it, for people who are maybe doing a PhD and are kind of new to the area and read the books about DNS and LES and RANDs, uh, often they don't show the cost of that. And that's why I like to show these slides where I kind of estimate the cost of, of doing a DNS. And so whilst from an academic point of view, DNS is used widely to study fundamental flow physics or uh, develop turbulence models or, or, or even for some applications um, where it's impossible to do any physical testing, but if we take the example of a high lift aircraft, which is, I guess, one of the grand challenges of CFD, um, can you compute a full aircraft in its full configuration accurately using CFD? It's, it's kind of one of the, you know, the big visions for CFD. These numbers are based on re very recent war model LES, and they're kind of scaled from that. And I'll talk more later about that. If you're taking a, a low Mach number case, so this isn't a high Mach number case, this is a low, so takeoff and landing, you probably need about 10 billion cells to do a DNS, industrial DNS. I'm not talking a channel flow or a period, I'm talking a, a complex geometry and the implications that has on a numerical method that could underpin it. If you're gonna have such fine grids, we all know you have to have low time steps. So let's say one e to minus seven, and if you do that and realize that you have to have a certain amount of physical flow through time over the aircraft, let's say four seconds, it's about 40 million iterations for an, for an explicit scheme. And then, and this is obviously where it's a back of an envelope, but if you take the computational speed based upon the uh, war model LES in a cutting edge code, 0 0.05 per time step, at 30,000 cells per core. So I know we're getting into the details here, but there is some logic behind these numbers. You get to about 23 days on 300,000 cores. The point is that is absolutely possible right now. You could get access to one of the big supercomputers, get 300,000 cores, and in theory run for 23 days if your allocation is big enough. The point is that if you work out the cost of that, let's say two or three cent per core hour, which an in industry is pretty established as a reasonable cost, it's about $5 million. I add a, an extra bit that um, thanks to our good friends at NVIDIA <laughs> and others, um, GPUs potentially can offer a slight cost reduction. Uh, some people are surprised when I say cost reduction. I'll show you in a few slides where 
that does often seem to be the case, but you're still talking maybe $3 million. So it's not whether it's possible or not, and don't get me wrong, there are still challenges with doing DNS of complex geometries. It's just the fact that it costs so much money that a wind tunnel does not cost $5 million per run. If you do 10 runs of this, you could probably build yourself a small wind tunnel. It, it's the economics that is the, the, the challenge here uh, and the reason why it wouldn't make um, sense. So the question then is, could the DNS go from $3 million now to $3,000? 3,000 being probably a reasonable amount of money to pay for a high fidelity run. So a thousand times cheaper. And could it go from 23 days to maybe five hours? Well, it, it's probably reasonable to assume that the work that people are doing here on improving numerical schemes and linear solvers and code optimization could make it twice as fast. I, I absolutely think that's possible, but that's still one and a half million dollars. Um, it's equally possible that it could be twice as fast because of next gen CPUs or GPUs. But then that's still $750,000 or six days. So even if you factor in that twice and twice again, it's still $750,000. And you never need to do just one run in a design cycle, you're doing 10 or 100. So could you really pay that much money for it? And then do you have a data center that can have 100,000 GPUs because every run I just showed you there was 1,000 GPUs and you've got a team of you know 100 engineers. So I, it's just a practical point that I wanna put that um, there is a challenge to using these sort of methods. And that's why the turbulence modeling is so important because if we can't do DNS, we have to do something to model the turbulence. And of course, this was a low Mach number case, not a high Mach number case. And there's no combustion or extra species or multi-physics. So that's why, in my opinion, the turbulence modeling is still a key thing because it's, it is too expensive to do the DNS. Uh, I'll, I'll go through these more quickly, but you know, it's well known things like LES dramatically reduce the cost down and the time, mainly because your time step can go higher because your grid is a little bit bigger, um, but it's still you know, hundreds of thousands of, of dollars, hence LES still being difficult. Rands on the other spectrum, as you know, the speakers showed, maybe a hundred dollars. I mean, that's why people use rands. It's it's just so much quicker, quicker to run, but also cheaper to run. It, it really is compared to a wind tunnel. A hundred dollars is a good value. A wind tunnel to hire a wind tunnel for a day is easily into the thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars, and the cost to manufacture the part. Um, where I think is the interesting bit is the middle ground, because we know RANS fails for many, many applications if we're talking about truly high accuracy, not just conceptual design, but true high accuracy. And that's obviously why there's this focus on hybrid RANS and warm of LES, because the cost is now somewhere in the middle, maybe in the thousands of dollars, which, which is still expensive for some, but is a compromise. Um, the reason, as I guess linked to the previous talk about you know bluff body aerodynamics, is if we take a car, and thanks to um, to Charlie and Upstream CFD for for providing this video, you can see that there is tremendous areas of highly turbulent flow, but it is not like that all over the car. Hence, a logic of doing perhaps some sort of hybrid approach where the bits that are quite steady, you could do in a RANS, and the bits over the tires and the uh, mirrors and the back where you would need something like LES. But regardless, the, the, the reality is the turbulence is highly unsteady for these sort of applications. And that's proved out in many workshops that have looked at cars and planes. And I've shown this slide many times where for like the lift coefficient, the using RANS approaches can even give you the completely the wrong sign. I mean, most people would accept if you're off by 10%, but if, if one method predicts positive lift and the other negative lift and you're a designer, that's totally unacceptable. You need to at least know the, map, the right direction. Is the car gonna lift off the ground or is it gonna stick to the ground? That's a pretty key engineering decision. So clearly that's why they're going to these methods, but that's still five to 20 times more expensive. 
and uh, later on I'll talk this is why the high performance computing is such a key um, part of this. I mentioned about these grand challenges. This is some very recent work that I think is hopefully um, interesting and maybe motivating because to be completely transparent, whilst in the automotive space, open foam has become a widely used code. Um, I think seven or eight of the Formula One teams use open foam. Many of the automotive OEMs use open foam in some um, flavor from some provider. But in the aerospace sector, it is almost invisible. Um, if you go into the aerospace sector, you very rarely see open foam uh, being used. It is starting to be used. Um, and and uh, the, the, the company I mentioned upstream are doing work in this workshop that I'm going to talk about. But I would encourage all of you that it's, um, I, it would be great to see more use of open foam in these sort of um, communities and workshops. So just to kind of motivate uh, maybe people who have developed uh, compressible solvers here within open foam who would like to try it out on, on an interesting test case. Um, this is the from the fourth high lift prediction workshop. It's a, it's a workshop that's done between Boeing and NASA, but also has DLR and Honora and various other uh, companies around the world to try and solve a complete high lift aircraft. What has long been the grand challenge. I'm showing work here that is not using open foam, but in fact using one of the um, one of the codes that's popular in uh, in the aerospace sector, CFD plus um, plus. But hopefully, as I say, it's a bit of motivation to try to run this case. The key point is that whilst the automotive space, and I don't know if anybody here is from an automotive OEM, but I'm sure some of you may have worked with them. You'll see many of them have moved to things like hybrid rounds or more model ES because they do see it as an advantage, even though it may cost them more money to do so. But in the aerospace sector, they still use RANs. And that's because uh, it was deemed too expensive and too challenging to run these sort of test cases. So, so part of this workshop was to, to, to test that out. You can find a lot more information on the actual website. If you Google um, high lift prediction workshop, they have all the presentations, all the slides, all the meshes, and in fact, the meshes that we created for this workshop are all available in open foam format. So you don't even have to convert them. You can just take it straight. And it's uh, ranges from about 100 million all the way up to about 600 million, uh, both free air and including the wind tunnel, because uh, as you'll see for this test case, it is actually important to model the wind tunnel. I can probably skip over this a little bit, um, but just to uh, just to say what it was, we were running hybrid RANs LES um, using best practices in terms of low dissipation, um, and importantly, running them for long enough that they're time averaged. This is it's not just the size of the mesh that is the reason for HPC; it's the fact that you have to run it for so long. Uh, people in combustion know this, people in other fields, but even for external aerodynamics, it's the real. Uh, challenge. So that, that's that's kind of a slide just to show how long you have to run for to get the time average. The one of the reasons that this hasn't been done by many people is because of the computational cost. Um, that's obviously part of the angle of AWS trying to help here is to unblock that. Um, I won't go through all the, the the details, but I guess the main point is every one of these simulations the seven angles of attack. So people who are in the aerospace sector know that when you have an aircraft in a wind tunnel, you don't just go straight to 21 degrees. You pitch, 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 pitch until you get to that. So in CFD, you also have to move up. So there was seven discrete angles of attack and the cost was a lot. It was about 2 million core hours just for one run of which contains seven angles of attack. So 2 million core hours for the hybrid RANDs and about 200,000 core hours for the RANDs. So you can calculate that based on the number of cores. That's quite a lot of time. And that's just the one run. And that's why we were you know, providing access. I think at one point we were running about 40,000 cores because we wanted to test different turbulence models and different meshes. Um, what's interesting, and. Just uh, I'll just comment on this just for a few moments. 
is the effect of wind tunnel modeling. If you do this in free air, so you mod, you've got an aircraft, and I'm saying this just in case any of you are motivated to join this workshop, this might be just a, a bit of a nugget of information um, that, that might be useful. If you run this in free air, there's actually some points where the RANs do a better job than hybrid RANs LES, which, which kind of um, perplexed us at the beginning. But what we found was that actually, once we modeled the entire plane in the wind tunnel, we managed to get much better correlation. And in some ways that's quite obvious because in this test, the wind tunnel, the plane is mounted on the bottom of the wind tunnel. It's a half model and it's literally like this. So you have a floor boundary effect. And so if you model the wind tunnel, you get the effect of the blockage from the wall. Whereas if you try and model it just in free air, you, you never get that, that, that blockage effect. Um, so in this case, then the hybrid runs improves. And this was interesting because if you look at this result, even if you go into 600 million cells, the RANS fails to capture the separation. That's why at companies like Boeing or Airbus or any others, for high lift design, they don't use CFD really. They use wind tunnels. With this work, if the mesh is fine enough, so about 300 million cells, you can almost get exactly on the experimental line. And I'm not just cherry picking results here. This was shown by other participants as well and has really been a, um, a turning point potentially in CFD being used for these high lift. But as I mentioned, the computational cost is the issue. And these are actual numbers, which in a sense uh, prove the previous numbers I had, that it's about $7,000 to do that, that um, case. But it, you know, it, it might take several days to run on a few thousand cores. So, it really is quite a step change from a company that let's say does RANs and it maybe takes eight hours to solve on 128 cores versus needing 5,000 cores running for two days. The issue then is how do we um, overcome that? You, you may say, well, that's just one code. How about the other codes? Well, actually it was quite similar. And I'm not, we've anonymized the results that's part of the workshop. We give people some level of anonymity, but it's similar. It's about 7,500 for one participant, about 6,000 for another. Um, but interestingly, and this is my comment on the GPUs, the, the code that was using a GPU solver was only about $2,500. So where does that come from? Because most people think GPUs cost more than CPUs. Well, we did some um, work with a company out of Bristol, Xenotech. And you can kind of ignore the, um, the letter soup that is AWS in terms of how we name our instances. But essentially what you can look at is that graph is for a full aircraft, at this time an Airbus type aircraft. And the y-axis is iterations per minute. So you know the bigger the better. And on the bottom, it's CPU nodes and GPUs. I, you have to scale it this way just to make the graph look right. So CPU nodes, as in 60 CPUs with 36 processors per node, but the GPUs are the individual GPUs. So I know that might sound a bit complicated, but it's if, if you don't do it that way, it, uh, it would look weird because the GPUs would have so little nodes and the CPUs have so many that the graph just looks odd. So the point is the GPUs, which is the red, gives you quite a jump in performance over the CPUs of various different flavors. But most people would assume that that would come at an increased cost, as in better performance, but it'll cost you more. Uh, but actually, it's the opposite. Um, if you take AWS public pricing, and as you can imagine, our pricing is a pretty good reflection of the cost because we work out you know, all the power costs, everything, and then put it as a single price. If you just literally go on our website, take the price for a GPU, times it by the number of hours it ran, and do the same for the CPU, it turns out to be about two or three times cheaper. And this has been shown by Siemens, by Ansys, and pretty much every other people who try their GPUs out on a cloud. So the key point, and the reason why the GPU motivation is actually not for performance, at least the customers I speak to, it's because it offers them a cheaper 
simulation with still good performance. So that instead of it costing you $7,000, it costs, costs you $2,000. So the, lo the next logical question is, right, well, where's the open phone GPU version then? Um, well, I guess there isn't one right now, but um, thanks to, to Stan for sharing this slide, you know, there is a lot of work going on um, between, in this case, you know, NVIDIA uh, and OpenFoam to try to um, port the code using the a um, uh, AMGX library to, you know, to port the linear solvers out. I think it's fair to say it's it's still in development, but the results look really promising. Uh, and, you know, as you showed on the previous slide, there is a very good reason why people want to use GPUs. Uh, and I think it almost becomes a necessity uh, to some extent um, to have a GPU version of your code. And the fact that OpenFoam um, doesn't currently have one is, I would say, a disadvantage compared to other codes that that, that do. Um, and there's a, a the fact that it's not just on a few nodes, they've actually tested this out on quite strong scaling on Summit. Um, so it, it's it's very interesting and, and I hope that that, um, that version is able to come out soon. But in, in fairness to the open foam community, um, there are multiple efforts going on and I'm not showing all of them here, but there's another one through the Ginkgo um, collaboration, the Exitim project uh, to try and again, have a, have a backend that could work across multiple different libraries um, whether it's uh, you know AMD, uh, Nvidia, um, OpenMP, et cetera. So there's there's quite a lot of um, different approaches uh, going on. But the real issue is that for most people, and I, I think I picked up uh, from a few of the talks, is that with their current on-prem, um, they either run out of storage or they don't have enough compute. So it's, it's easy to say that my simulation will run faster if I have 5,000 cores, but then if you don't have 5,000 cores, how are you gonna do it? And having worked in companies myself, it's difficult to convince management to go and buy a 50,000 core cluster. Um, it, it's, it's just hard to get the commitment because they're worried about the utilization. Uh, is it really gonna be used all the time, especially if this is more development work? Same with GPUs. Uh, I speak to people all the time and they say, well, should my next cluster be a GPU cluster or should it be a CPU cluster? And it's a hard decision to make if you've got to stick with it for three or four years. So obviously the motivation to the cloud is to give you that flexibility, um, which is even more relevant for high fidelity CFD because the reality is it's not like everyone's going to drop their RANS usage overnight it will come in bits and pieces. And so occasionally you might want to run on 5,000 cores, but not all the time. So it's kind of hard to design an in-house system that can have the utilization to make it cost-effective and run these big jobs. And so that's why there's a lot of interest from companies to, to use the cloud because it gives them that ability to spike uh, as needed. And, um, and that's even more the case with machine learning. Um, because of the access to cutting edge GPUs, et cetera. Uh, I, but to be fair, there are two camps. Some companies go all in the cloud and they just move their entire system onto the cloud. Uh, and then many do more of hybrid where they're kind of bursting. You know, they've run out of capacity. All right, I'll run a job in the cloud and then bring it back down. We see both use cases and it's really dependent on the, uh, the individual company. Um, However, I would say that probably to most people, the cloud is still a little bit of a mystery. Um, this, I would say majority of people don't actually really know what it is, especially because the cloud is used as a, a, a very common term. Uh, if you have on your iPhone, you know, there's a cloud thing there. Every single company has a cloud thing. So it's kind of a little bit mysterious of what it really is. Um, but from an AWS point of view, I mean, the cloud is essentially pay-as-you-go access to compute and storage and services on top. And I'll mention that in a minute. But to give an idea of the scale, I mean, this slide gets old literally every week, but we have about 31 regions right now. And a region is just like a geographic area where we have resources. Each region typically has three or four separate, what we call availability zones. 
what that basically means is a an ability in case there is a massive uh, flood or a power issue that you could fail over. Each of those availability zones has many data centers. So if you do the maths in your head, you can see that there's hundreds of availability zones, potentially thousands of data centers, and every one of those data centers has hundreds of thousands or millions of compute cores and storage. So uh, the amount of compute available in the cloud, it is fair to say it is virtually unlimited because it's such a massive number that it's unlikely you would ever um, use it. Also from a storage point of view, that's true. We have actually quite a few individual customers who have more, am I using the right term? Is exa, exabits or wh whatever that storage amount is. Um, exabytes of storage just by one customer. I won't say the name, but it's uh, a company that you would know quite well. So there's a lot of compute. Um, the other thing that's making it interesting is this is not only um, commercial or standard usage, but actually all the way up to top secret, which is particularly relevant for defense companies. Uh, and also you can get access uh, in China. You know, we have several China regions as well for companies who are based in China or uh, have a global um, workforce. Um, but it isn't just about servers that you can uh, run on. It is also about services on top of that. So for example, um, from a high-performance computing point of view, we have schedulers essentially at a service. So if you want to make a cluster, you don't have to boot up loads of nodes, pass the SSH key between, install Lustre, install Slurm. You just essentially have a service that does that for you. So there are, I would guess, added value on top, not just servers for hire. The reason that's relevant for CFD is quite a few companies have realized that they can actually offer their software. And this is particularly true for open phone variants. Um, it started with companies like, you know, SimScale, Dive Solutions, OnScale, Nabla Flow, and many others who realized that they could offer their services through a web-based front end where the customer doesn't need to think about the compute and the compute's in the back end, essentially. And that's been now seen by the ISVs. So companies like Siemens or Cadence or Ansys all have their own cloud SaaS offerings, SaaS meaning software as a service where you just bring up something, let's say like star CCM and you click a button run and in the back end, it's spinning up some servers on AWS and running them. So that's what we call by a SaaS. And that's, if you're developing a code, it's a nice way to give it to people without them having to take a binary, install it and all that. So that's um, been interesting. And for people who are more into the CFD um, community and see what's going on, there's also quite a few brand new startups with quite significant funding from venture capitalists that almost all of them offer it primarily as a cloud-based platform. So Flex Compute, Luminary Cloud, Volcano Platforms, these are all brand new, typically GPU-based codes that are pitching it very much as a kind of modern code that you take directly from, from the cloud. So I, I'm trying to be as, um, I guess, I'm, I'm not trying to sell you the cloud, I'm just telling you the reality of what the companies are using it for. It's not just service for hire, but it's a way of distributing your uh, software. It, to be fair, there are also companies on top of that who offer some sort of ability for you to run multiple codes. So Rescale, probably a lot of people have heard of, Uber Cloud, Total CAE, or even like Ruggiero, who's here, who has his own cloud-based you know, consultancy company where you can use it. So you know, there's a lot of reasons why the cloud is becoming appealing um, to, to, to academics. But of course, some actually don't want to do anything of the others. They literally just want to hire servers, essentially, instead of buying an on-prem HPC. And I guess that's, that's the use case that a lot of people have heard of. Um, probably one of the most uh, well-known people um, who are using AWS is Formula One. So Formula One management who own Formula One run all of their simulations on AWS. And these are you know, close to a billion cell 
hybrid runs simulations that you know took them several days to run in house, but it only take about ten hours uh, on AWS. Um, and I include this slide mainly because I quite like this graphic. Um, they also run on some of our new processors that I'll talk about later. Um, but maybe don't believe just me. It's interesting to give examples of other companies that could very well just use an on-prem system. There's, there's no, uh, they would only use the cloud if it kind of made sense for them to do it. Um, and this is an example from Upstream CFD, um, who I think are, uh, you know, a kind of open foam, partially based consultancy who are, have a historic history of providing more turbulence modeling and specialist uh, capabilities. They ran that driver that I want to mention right at the beginning, that automotive case, uh, and they were interested to study it, partly um, to help towards the community, uh, but it was also its good excuse to try to run it on, um, on the cloud and see if it would help. Now, if you're not into the cloud, you're probably wondering what the hell is this? But this is the equivalent of showing, I don't know, equations on your graph. If you go to any IT or tech conferences, architecture diagrams are the kind of standard thing to show because when you use the cloud, it's lots of little services that you typically put together and all through APIs. So essentially you're able to communicate between all these individual services and build up a workflow that you can fully template. And so I won't go on there. I'd encourage you to go and speak to some of the upstream folk if you want to learn more about it. Uh, but the point is that it, it you can essentially link things like S3, that is the storage, with things like um, the parallel cluster, that's the compute orchestration, and many others, and, and link them all together to build this really complicated uh, workflow. The main reason I mention this is just on the slides, because I guess there's still a, a perception that the cloud is actually not fast enough or cheap enough to be used for high-performance computing, that it's essentially fine if you're just running a single node, but if you want to run anything bigger, then you know you need to have an on-prem system, uh, and that's that was true probably about five years ago. To be fair, um, now absolutely not the case. You can match the performance of almost any on-prem system um, with um, with with a cloud provider. Um, sometimes the cloud may be faster. Sometimes it may be slower. Um, there's I can't remember his name. Jack. I should know his name. He's one of the you know major people in HPC. He actually put an article recently that very accurately said that the R&D budget of the hyperscalers far exceeds any traditional um, kind of hardware company, maybe with the exception of NVIDIA. Uh, <laughs> um, but it really is, you know, building a lot of hardware. So the technology is moving on, you know, pretty quickly. What this graph shows you is just the number of cells per core that you can scale these applications to. Uh, and it really shows that, you know, 50,000 cells per core or lower, you can still get good scaling. But the point is often on the cost. And so this was talking about, you know, the different cost of instances, et cetera. This is more just to motivate you to maybe have a look at this stuff. Uh, we don't really have time to dive into it in too much detail because I did want to cover another topic. Um, one of the things, though, I guess, which is our investment in things like CFD is we actually, whilst we also have Intel, AMD, NVIDIA chips, uh, we also have our own. We design our own based on the Arma, uh, uh, Armac architecture, which we call Graviton. And uh, you know, I'm part of the team that, that works on these sort of things. And we design this almost principally for CFD and weather in mind. So we benchmarked open foam lots developing these instances. Uh, and so you can see from these results on this driver type application that what we call HPC 7G actually gives one of the best performance and the lowest cost. I mention this because we, it's just to give you a point that open foam actually helps us to design our hardware. So open foam is one of our standard benchmark suites that, that we use. Um, I'll skip through that. That's just talking about sometimes you need lots of RAM and that's useful, you know, on the cloud, et cetera. I wanted to get to, uh, I guess, the buzzword of the moment, which is the machine learning side. Before getting into the CFD bit, um, Machine, most companies, whether it's the cloud or traditional hardware, are, let's be honest, really designing their hardware for machine learning, not 
for people doing CFD in a large way. That's just the reality. Um, what we can do is take advantage of that hardware, of course, but the huge rise in GPU performance is not because of CFD, it's because of machine learning. Um, we have customers running, our, you, you would not believe how many GPUs are used by machine learning customers. It is tremendous growth. It is not just a buzz, it is genuine. It is absolutely massive. Um, but we can take advantage of that development from hardware, software, for potentially for CFD. Uh, and as you know, there's many different ways that machine learning could be used for CFD. You could use it to help build a turbulence model better, improve coefficients. You could do it to cluster results, whether they you know, match a certain pattern. You could go all the way and use uh, computer vision technologies to learn from images input to output. Uh, or you could try and learn the PDEs directly. There are many, many different areas that it could be used for. And of course, you almost need a talk of its own um, to, to, to go through there. But the key point is this, you need data. And as one of the speakers said, storage is the issue. That's one of the reasons that people tend to like the cloud for machine learning because they don't have a data issue. And if you run all your simulations, you can save it and then pipe it into a machine learning uh, pipeline. Um, I'm not the expert in this, but we are trying to support the, you know, the data science and machine learning special interest group uh, that Andrew and Thomas are, are running. Um, and so I definitely encourage to speak to them. I think it's a great area to be involved in. Um, I don't know if this video is showing. Oh, yes. This is a great example of embedding machine learning within an open foam type simulation. So this is active flow control over these pins. And as you notice in a second, once they start spinning, just how much the separation um, reduces behind. And this is using reinforcement learning within open foam. Uh, and we help give them uh, access to AWS. So for their recent hackathon, everyone could be coding up and running this uh, and not be bottlenecked by the, the compute. But the, the final thing I wanted to go through was the example of deep learning for CFD. So this, this one idea of could machine learning be used as a uh, like a surrogate model to do conceptual design. So honestly, like a RANS-like thing. And I wanted to show this quick example that we did internally just to really prove a point of why this is interesting. So in this sort of example, it's the idea that if you've run lots of simulations, you could learn from those prior simulations, train a model, and then give a new geometry, where it's a car, a bridge, a boat, and predict that, but the inference would only take a few seconds. So, so how does that work and why does this link to the greater use of sort of higher fidelity uh, CFD? Well, the example I'm gonna show is on this driver case that I frequently show. And so for this, um, we ran about 30 different car shapes, but we ran them all with a high fidelity setup. So it's about 300 million cells, 10,000 cores for 24 hours each. How does this link with high fidelity CFD? Well, bear with me a moment and hopefully you'll see some of the logic for it. If you train that machine learning model using RANS data, it's only going to be as accurate as the RANS data. It's not suddenly, unless you do some transfer learning, it's not going to get more accurate than RANS. That's the best it could be. Minus the error according to the machine learning. But you know, the actual fundamental data is the RANS. Um, now, a RAND simulation might take, let's say, an hour to run or two hours to run. So if you suddenly make that a minute, you know, because the inference is so fast, that's nice. It's a good saving. But it's not as impressive as if you were to train with hybrid RAND LES data, which took you 48 hours to run, and now the inference is still a minute. So the logic here is actually if you train with high fidelity data, you're essentially getting a high fidelity model for dramatically cheaper. So there is a relevance to this whole thing of high fidelity with machine learning. The problem is you need to train using high fidelity data, but I hope you see my look, maybe just think about that for a moment, but there's a reason why this machine learning could make high fidelity methods cheaper because you can train with them 
and the method. Now, okay, what do I mean by fast? Okay, well, I'll, I'll go through this reasonably quickly, but, and by the way, this isn't cutting edge work. This is just more of an example. There are many papers that show this sort of stuff, you know, using a CNN uh, sort of algorithm where we train based on the, the geometry in this case and some forces. And so what we can do is we can take 20 or 30 cases, train with that model. The training takes about 20 minutes on a small GPU. And then when we do the inference on a new geometry, it runs in less than a second and costs, I don't know, about half a dollar or something. But the accuracy is, um, well, sorry, the error is less than 2%. So basically that means that you've gone from taking 48 hours, sorry, 24 hours on 10,000 cores for a normal hybrid RANS to give you that drag to it taking you um, less than a minute on for the inference at lower. You still need to pay for the training, but the training only takes 20 minutes on a GPU, which is you know a dollar or something. You could say, well, what about that? You actually have to run the, the stuff to begin with. Well, yes, but we're assuming that you would run them anyway. So this is just like getting some extra for free. But of course, forces aren't enough. So you could also take slices, image slices. So with this, we took some slices behind the car and then we put that through the model. That's obviously a slightly different algorithm to take advantage of images, but it was a similar story where, I don't know if you can see this, but the left is the predicted and the middle is the actual. And basically you can't see much difference between them. So, the, I'm, I'm only showing this to give you the sense of why it's of interest, because it can, in theory, give you the potential for a, a third tool, you know, RANS, high fidelity, or fourth wind tunnel, and a machine learning tool. And that's why so many companies are looking, um, looking into this. So I know that was a lot to get through. So um, in summary, I think you can never just talk about accuracy or cost or runtime. They all come together. I think HPC genuinely is a bottleneck that can be unblocked with advances in high performance computing and the sort of cloud access. I would say the cloud access is also a democratization because anybody who has a credit card can get access to that compute. In the past, you'd have to, particularly for let's say a startup, you'd have to have the ability to build a big supercomputer. Now you don't, you just can just take a credit card and pay for it. Um, I think it's exciting times for machine learning and CFD, um, but there's limited examples of scale. Um, but I think it's fair to say that cloud does give you access to GPUs and the compute, which kind of unblocks that side of it. But uh, with that, um, yeah, thanks very much. Thank you, Neil. Very interesting talk. and. Uh... Thinking about cost is, as you said, okay. something we do a lot. So that was interesting. There was actually um, an article in JFM about 10 years ago called Money Versus Time, <laughs> in which they argued about the cost of doing flow control. So that, oh, but okay. it's very, very okay. rare, actually. So um, do we have any questions? Awesome. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, I am sometimes, just for the fun of it, thinking a lot about how to make a business out of uh, CFD. I guess a lot of people here do that. And one of the very appealing thing about cloud is that there is this, uh, um, what is it called, DPL loophole, which you also mentioned. A company can take and copy the uh, open phone code, put it on the cloud, and then make their own. Uh, extensions and, and advances and then sell it solve software as a service without giving back to the community and i'm more, i'm sort of tempted to try that myself with my own development but on the other hand i can also see that i guess this is not really um sustainable in the long term if people start doing that do you have any considerations about that or concerns or comments to um 
uh, to that? Yeah, I, I guess my example was um, broader than just open foam, just CFD in general. Um, at least in my opinion, and I think a lot of companies see this way, the whole reason that they're involved with open foam is it's a two-way exchange, that they should be able to gain the knowledge of what other people are doing, but it's only fair that they give back. You can still make a commercial product of wrapping stuff around it, making it easy for people to run, particularly from a compute point of view, give them access to compute, but this is just my personal opinion. I would hope that any company that makes a commercial product would give as much back to the community as what they take, but I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know. So yeah. that's the that's a moral imperative we we'll hopefully all have, but it, there's nothing legal saying that you have to give back, right? And I guess that's Again, the loophole. I, I don't know. The, I don't know the law on this. I'm sure other people do here. Um, maybe there, I, I genuinely don't know what the rule is on that. But more from a philosophical point of view, I think you can help people to run open foam and still give stuff back, right? Or equally, you can make you can do it. It's down to the company, I guess. Um, Thank you. Thank you, a very good presentation. Um, like the machine learning people really seem to like their half precision or even lower by now. Do you see anything coming like maybe mixed precision or exciting new hardware? which might be more feasible for us uh, CFD guys. Did I hear your question right? You said in machine learning, they use MIL-6 mixed precision. Could we use it for CFD? Is that what you just said? Yeah, usually the GPUs are just much more efficient for like half precision or even less. Yeah. Um, we tend to do double. Right? Well, um, yes, that that's true. Although, um, and I suspect there are people in the room who work with them. If you work with a Formula One team, actually, uh, most, and you may be surprised, most of them use single precision, not for the meshing, but for the solving. They actually use single precision for the solving and maybe mixed or doubled for the meshing, but it's so much faster in open foam um, that many of them already do take advantage of single or, or mixed precision. Um, now, obviously, there's an impact potential on the accuracy, and maybe that is more relevant for let's say single phase external aerodynamics with high y plus um but yeah people are already doing it and um yeah i said they're already doing it yeah thanks a good question other questions yeah thanks for the nice talk i have a question for you is uh, about the cost of cpu versus gpu how much of this cost can be split for cap cost, so the acquirement to buy the GPU cost itself, and how much of this cost come from consumption, electricity consumption, in your experience? Well, I guess the easy answer on AWS, there's only a single number. So everything I showed you on here is factoring all of that in. When we give a number, it's already factored in the cost for us on our power, on the, the cap, it, all of it. It's just a single number. What we typically find is if you're kind of hinting towards, or maybe not hinting, but just as an extra comment, some people, if you compare the cloud to an on-prem, they don't always take it at the full costs, like all the power and the data center and all this kind of stuff, and just the cost it takes to buy it from vendor X. But yeah, everything I said on here is just literally a single number that encapsulates it all just because that's the only thing we break out. So it's kind of easier for me to do that comparison. From an on-prem comparison, I'm not sure. I, I, I guess there's been other comparisons about GPUs being more energy efficient and therefore it um, reducing your energy costs and things like that. Um, but I, personally, we've not done those studies. Okay, thanks. Sure. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Just a curiosity. Uh, what do you think will be the uh, future, a uh, near future trend for GPUs usage and how this could impact on the final cost of uh, cloud services in terms of yeah, economic uh, costs? 
Well, what's uh, what's interesting, there's a healthy environment of different vendors all pushing different technologies. So um, it's the truth is it's actually genuinely quite hard to know because on one side you have the advance on the GPU side with obviously the AMD, um, sorry, the NVIDIA GPUs and the, you know, the new one that's just come out. Then you've got AMD GPUs, which are coming out. Um, from the others, you've got a lot of this high bandwidth memory uh, and sort of 3D stacking on CPUs. And then you've got things like joining the GPUs and the CPUs together. It's, it's, it's kind of hard to know because um, until they come out, we never truly know. Uh, and sometimes something's announced and then it gets dropped and then, you know, so it's, I think it's a good thing for everybody here that there is a very healthy ecosystem in developing things. Um, what's nice to see as well, both ourselves, um, companies like NVIDIA and also the European project is around ARM uh, architectures as well. There's a real growth in that and that's good from an energy point, point of view. So it's, yeah, it's not clear where it's going to be actually. But all of it will be faster performance and I think lower cost. So it should be a win-win. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay. I think we finished the questions.